thank you for joining us today and welcome to another timely discussion from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. I'm Cliff May, I'm FDD's founder and president. Uh, we're honored to host the, one of the United States 11 combatant commanders for today's discussion, General Stephen R. Lyons of the U.S. Transportation Command. The U.S. military can move its people and equipment around the world with a speed and agility never before seen in history. U.S. Transportation Command makes that happen. Today, General Lyons will discuss how Transcom does what it does. He also will talk about the impact of the pandemic, of the threat environment overall, our allies, air refueling, military sea lift, cyber threats, and much, much more. As most of you know, FDD is a research institution. We focus exclusively on national security and foreign policy. We're nonpartisan. We accept no funds from foreign governments. Never have, never will. This event is hosted by FDD's Center on Military and Political Power, which seeks to promote understanding of the defense strategies, the policies, the capabilities necessary to deter and, if necessary, defeat threats to the freedom, uh, the security, and prosperity of Americans and of America's allies. CMPP features FDD's Long War Journal, which provides original and accurate reporting on ongoing conflicts, as well as professional development and research opportunities for active duty military officers, active duty military personnel, as part of FDD's National Security Alumni Network. We also have an active mil visiting military officers program, hosting military officers, who contribute to our work throughout the year. The center is led by former National Security Advisor, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, who serves as chair of CMPP's Board of Advisors. CMPP is run by Brad Bowen, the center's senior director, who will moderate today's session. Brad served as National Security Advisor to members of the Senate Armed Services and Foreign Relations Committees, and he was for more than 15 years an active duty U.S. Army officer, during that time, he was both a Black Hawk pilot and an assistant professor at West Point. Today's program is one of many we host throughout the year. For more information on all our work and all our areas of focus, we encourage you to visit our website, fdd.org. We also encourage you to follow us on Twitter, at FDD. With that, I am now pleased to turn the floor over to my colleague, Brad Bowman, to introduce General Lyons and begin the discussion. Thank you, Cliff. I want to thank everyone who is watching. I hope you and your families are safe and well. And I especially want to thank General Lyons for joining me for this discussion. As Cliff said, General Lyons is the commander of U.S. Transportation Command, which is based at Scott Air Force Base, Illinois, and is one of DOD's 11 combatant commands. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army in 1983 and has spent decades serving our country in uniform. Since 2003 alone, he has spent more than 40 months deployed to the U.S. Central Command Area of Responsibility in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. In Af Afghanistan in 2010 was actually where I first met General Lyons and came to respect him very much. Sir, welcome and thank you for making time to join me for this discussion. Brad, thanks. It's a real pleasure to be with you and it's a pleasure to see you again from our time in Kabul. Uh, that many years ago, but you you look great and thanks for what you're doing. Thank you, sir. It's a real honor. Um, there is so much that we can discuss in just one hour. Uh, so with your permission, let's get started. Uh, General, you know, for those who are less familiar with Transcom, perhaps I can start by just asking you to describe its mission, its components, activities. In highly technical terms, what do you do? <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I'm really proud to represent the men and women of U.S. Transportation Command. If you think of the defense transportation system, we run the defense transportation system. So airlift, uh, sea lift, patient movement, area refueling, uh, manage the global posture that enables global mobility. Our core purpose really is to project the force, sustain the force on a global scale, our time and place of choosing. We create multiple dilemmas for our adversaries, and most importantly, we create multiple options for our national leadership. So. Very proud of the team. We have components, uh, air component and air mobility command, uh, maritime component, military sea lift command, and an army component in the surface deployment and distribution command, as well as the joint enabling command uh, headquartered at Norfolk. In uh, preparation for this, I was reviewing some of uh, your, your posture testimony before the Armed Services Committee. And, 
And uh, from your written testimony, uh, it was just there were some statistics about the sheer volume of what Transcom does on an annual basis. And, you know, it, it's uh, it's breathtaking. I mean, 40, you know, in 2019 alone, <clears throat> 43 brigade size overseas movements, 26 million square feet of military cargo, 1.9 million passengers, 1.3 million tons of cargo. I mean, it just, it, you know, it's 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 an, it's a it's a it's an endeavor that I don't think many Americans fully appreciate the scope and scale of it. But there was one anecdote in your testimony that I really admired and, and I thought was worth highlighting. It was about one particular soldier who was in, in, injured in Afghanistan and what Transcom did to get uh, that soldier the medical care they needed. I don't know if you recall that or not, if you might want to comment on that. But uh, I think it really demonstrates both the cap capability of Transcom, but also the value we put on an individual soldier's life. No, I think you're exactly right. I do recall the case uh, last year, I think it was in the August time frame. And in fact, uh, General Clark, the SOCOM commander, mentioned this particular incident to the President of the United States uh, during our dinner in the fall. Uh, but this is a case where a, a soft warrior was severely wounded. Uh, we were able to pick him up uh, in our aerial evacuation network from Bodrum, uh, flew him nonstop uh, all the way to Brook Army Medical Center, uh, multiple aerial refueling efforts en route. Uh, if you can imagine a platform on a C-17 completely transformed into an aerial intensive care unit, critical care teams, all the teams required uh, to, to make sure that this uh, young warrior made it back into the hands of our great medical experts at Brook Army Medical Center. And so we're really proud of this uh, patient movement aerial evacuation system. And there's only one nation in the world, Brad, as you can imagine, that can do that, or that would take the effort to apply that many resources against one great warrior. And that's how much we, we care, and that's how much we love our warriors out there. Well said. A 19-hour nonstop flight, and that soldier is alive today and, and with his or her family because of that. That's that's extraordinary. Um, we'd love to transition to um, a, a discussion on COVID-19. Uh, as you know better than me, we all continue to struggle with COVID-19, the global pandemic. I'm curious how it's impacted Transcom. Yeah, but it certainly has had an impact. Uh, I would tell you from the beginning, uh, I think Secretary Esper was pretty clear uh, with his priorities, and uh, it was simply this. It was simply uh, make sure you can continue to operate your wartime mission, uh, and we, we can and we do. Uh, protect the force uh, as best you can, and we have done that with uh, mitigation measures. And then support the whole of government effort uh, to the extent uh, you know, needed by the, by the whole of government effort. And so that was the, that was the priority of effort. Uh, from the beginning. Uh, the, one of the first things we had to contend with, to be honest with you, was the recognition that inside the department, we didn't have an ability readily available to move highly contagious patients. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we resurrected uh, what, was, what was called the transportation isolation system back from the Ebola crisis uh, and, and brought that back off the shelf and trained crews up. But more importantly, we established a joint operational urgent need uh, of which the Air Force, uh, DITRA, DARPA, and a number of other agencies really went to work and developed a material solution uh, in less than 90 days uh, called a negative pressure chamber that allows us to move uh, highly, highly contagious patients around the globe. And, and we're doing that today. Um, in other areas, we've obviously provided support uh, to move the force like hospitals up in New York and so forth. Uh, we've provided support to move test kits early on from Europe into the United States. Uh, we've provided airlift support to, uh, to donate ventilators to other countries around the globe that were in short supply. And so we're really pleased about that. One of the other efforts we, we endeavored upon is to help the State Department for American citizen repatriation uh, during the initial phases of the crisis. So, so very, very, very proud of the team and the COVID effort. That's great. How, uh, how concerned are you, generally speaking, obviously we're having an unclassified discussion here, but how concerned are you generally that uh, COVID-19 might negatively impact your ability to carry out your wartime mission? We, uh, we watch it very closely. And uh, one of the things that we watch very closely is the impact on the economy. Uh, you may know this, but many of your viewers may not. Uh, we have established relationship with commercial carriers and uh, through emergency preparedness programs where we activate things like the, the Civil Reserve Aviation Fleet or their voluntary intermodal sea lift fleet, for example. And so we have a dependency in our ability to project the force on these commercial carriers. 
We work very, very closely with them. And inside some of these segments, and particularly the passenger segment of the airline industry, has been really, really hit hard. Yeah. Uh, if you can imagine 70% of the fleet uh, parked right now. It was even higher. Uh, 90% of domestic travel, international travel down. Uh, the cash burn rate is just e enormous. And I do worry uh, about whether our, our aviation industry and the passenger segment specifically, how long they can weather the storm. And as they come back out the back end, will it look the same and will we have the same capacity to support our, our national defense needs? I do think in our engagements with industry, it is a very resilient industry, but it's going to take some time. It, it, it took about five to seven years after the financial uh, fall out to recover the airline industry, probably about two to three years after 9-11. And so we've got a long ro road ahead to make sure we bring back these industries and the industrial base uh, for the department so we can project and sustain the force. These challenges with the uh, global pandemic, of course, are layered upon a, uh, a geostrategic environment that's already changing. I noted in your uh, Senate Armed Service Committee uh, hearing earlier this year, you said, quote, in the past, we were able to deploy our forces when we wanted, assemble them where we wanted, and employ them how we wanted. But you said, quote, the world is changing, unquote. In terms of the ability of Transcom to conduct its mission, and in terms of the action plan, actions and plans of our competitors or adversaries, how is the world changing? What did you mean by that when you, when you testified to that earlier this year? Well, as we look at uh, the potential for uh, a, a peer, near peer uh, competitor, uh, and of course, uh, not our preference to move to conflict, but we have to be prepared for that. Yeah. Uh, and if we were to move to that, uh, to, to escalate the conflict, um, I think things would be dramatically different than what we've experienced in the last 20 to 30, really over 50 years. Uh, and that would require us, uh, as really called out in the defense strategy, uh, to be able to operate in all under all domain persistent attack. And, and so we do look at this. Uh, we look at how to integrate all the war fighting functions, how to create the conditions uh, for us to be able to operate, whether that's intelligence, uh, whether it's protection. Uh, and essentially, if you think about what we do uh, every day, it's a little bit of strategic maneuver. In other words, it's the ability to position uh forces right that provide physical psychological and temporal advantage uh, in day-to-day -day competition and in crisis and so we want to always have that comparative advantage to be able to project the force and sustain the force at our time and place of choosing so we spent a fair amount of time thinking about that uh we obviously spent a fair amount of time thinking about the the, the cyber risks and vulnerabilities associated and then really applying a lot of effort to mitigate those risks no, that's excellent. You 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 referred to, and I, I suspect you have regularly you referred to uh, America's ability to projections project and sustain its forces around the globe as a quote strategic comparative advantage unquote for the U.S. Um, why why do you why do you say that? Why is that projection sustainment capability a strategic advantage, and why are adversaries trying to deny or undercut that advantage? Yeah, I think when you uh, you know think tanks like yours or others when they really look. From an adversary's perspective, looking at the United States, uh, there are several elements they really admire. Uh, one being global command and control. One being this robust network of allies and partners. Uh, of course, our ability to develop leaders and empower leaders at echelon. But the other is this ability to project uh, joint the joint force uh, uh, transoceanic distances, and that really does distinguish the United States of America. One element that distinguishes the United States of America as a global superpower, and so we must we must maintain that. And with most of the force elements based in the United States, it's Transcom's job to make sure that we can lift them and move them to where we need to employ them. Um, and, and so that's uh, that's that's the essence of it. Yeah, and I noted that uh, you've said in the past that roughly 85% of the joint force is based in the continental United States. So, heaven forbid, no one wants a conflict with the China or Russia. But if we did, 85% uh, 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 potentially of, of of our equipment and personnel would be moving from the continental United States, and that presents a huge task, obviously, for you and your command, but also potential uh, uh, vulnerabilities and things that our adversaries might target. No, that's that that's correct. Yeah, uh, that's correct. And so and so what we want to do uh, is we want to have many paths. 
we, we want to have resiliency. Uh, there's a military utility in resiliency. And uh, we don't want to ever be find ourselves uh, with a single point of failure or being able to allow our competitor or our adversary uh, right to deny our ability uh, or to significantly degrade our ability to project the force. We know there'll be plenty of fog and friction, but at yeah. the end of the day, we must we must be successful. No, that's that's excellent. I, obviously, you realize this know this well, sir, far better than I do. But I think it's important for those those watching to understand that this this environment that we confront now is very different than what we saw, for example, in 1991, where we were able to build the uh, the mountain of steel or, or of combat power in the Gulf over weeks and months, kind of on our own timeline, unimpeded, unharassed. You know, those that would, uh, from from my analysis, just on the outside, that would not be a good assumption if we were to find ourselves in a conflict with a with a China or a Russia. No, I think yeah, you're 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 exactly right. Uh, we we could well find ourselves having to fight our way in. Uh, and, you know, not even the homeland is a sanctuary. Yeah. Um, the uh, generally speaking and with, you know, with appropriate deference to OSD and the Joint Staff and the Regional Combat Commands, what are the implications of this reality you and I just described for pre-positioning equipment and for the forward positioning or stationing even of U.S. forces now in order to reduce the forces that Transcom would have to get to the conflict from CONUS in a, in a future conflict? Yeah, well, I think you, I think you always want balance, right? Uh, you, you, there, there is a value in presence. There's no question about it, uh, for many, for many reasons, uh, deterrence, assurance, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. But you want to have a blunt force, uh, mm -hmm. and then you can reinforce that, right, with an immediate response or crisis response force uh, in time and space. And uh, you know, where where we come in is the ability to move an immediate force tonight. So think of the 82nd Airborne Division deployment in January or a very heavy, uh, decisive surge force uh, that takes a little bit more time to get there, but there's no question about it uh, at the end of the day, who's gonna come out as a, as a winner. So we want the ability to do all that and balance and what uh, forward presence or prepositioned forces allows us to do is close the initial elements of that force more rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can close the decisive force on our timeline. That's excellent. Uh, Transcom, uh, conducts regular uh, exercises to test to make sure that the the air refueling and, and the sea lift and all that is in, in an appropriate state of readiness. Um, I, uh, you know, you, you had uh, Defender Europe 20 recently. Obviously, some of that was curtailed, as I understand it, due to COVID-19. But I'm curious, what was Transcom's role in Defender Europe 20, which I understand was significant? And what were kind of the after action uh, review lessons learned that you that you drew from that? Yeah, it was a, a very big exercise, as you alluded to, uh, and, and, a, and a very well-planned exercise. Uh, our role obviously was significant because we moved the force elements uh, from the continent of the United States to Europe. Uh, and as if I recall correctly, it was somewhere around 25,000 uh, troops. But it was also constituted uh, the largest movement of forces. Uh, think about return of forces to Europe, the old Reforger days, uh, probably since we had Reforger days, you wow. know, when, when the, you know, uh, post Cold War period of time, uh, and so we were able to uh, to exercise with the Joint Force, uh, both in lifting uh, personnel and equipment, uh, as well as inside the maritime domain, which was a little bit uh, new for us. Which I was really pleased to see our maritime component coordinating uh, the handoff of uh, uh, sea lifts and sea lift ships in motion between Second Fleet and Sixth Fleet. And, uh, you know, out of that, we were really able to take a look at, at, the, at, the, at that aspect of how we would uh, protect our lines of communication, uh, look at the emissions control uh, of some of our vessels and platforms, and think through how we would protect, perhaps mitigate that if we had to go to a more stealth uh, kind of a signature. So really a, a, a fantastic exercise. Anytime we have the opportunity to do that, is is good uh, for us for our readiness as well as to reinforce uh, General Walters out at UCOM, which is our main effort. That's great. I'm curious uh, what your response to this would be. You know, when I hear a lot of folks talking about, uh, you know, what we need from our allies in Europe, you know, there's often focus on combat capability, which is certainly understandable and important. But the more I learn, the more it seems like we also need uh, countries like Germany to also focus on infrastructure, ports 
railheads, uh, roads, bridges, tunnels. Can we get our forces from here to there? And a lot of that is the logistical stuff that Transcom is so good at. Do you, do you think I have that about right, or would you caveat what I said there at all? No, I, I, I think you got it exactly right, Brad. And I think this is probably underappreciated sometimes. Uh, the fact that we can move forces on a global scale at the rate that we do is all underscored by this very advanced uh, network of allies and partners that provide the access to basing and the overflight required to accommodate this very large global logistics network. And if we didn't have these allies and partners uh, uh, with us providing this capacity, uh, it would be very, very difficult to project the force. And so I know a lot of times we'll focus on, uh, and, and we should, on, on contributions and so forth, in terms of monetary contribution, in terms of their investments and interoperability. But this is really important area uh, because as we decide to, to reshape and relocate forces, the key is we've got to be able to get back to where we need to go to very rapidly. And our allies and partners are the key to success in this in this area. Absolutely, and you mentioned earlier kind of the all domain persistent attack that our, our competitors or adversaries might use against that. In, in, that, in the context of that, you mentioned, uh, and we'll get more into cyber later, but you know, contract value chains, invest, and this is one that caught my eye, in, invest in critical global choke points. And so I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you know, when we have an ally or partner uh, you know, uh, in control of or adjacent to a critical choke point or a port or a canal, um, that's really significant. And when we see as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, uh, Beijing um, purchasing key ports and, and establishing bases near key waterways, that, uh, that that's something that Americans should be uh, rightly concerned about, I think. Uh, no, no, no question about it. Uh, and you can see it uh, clearly on a map. They, uh, they, they clearly get the importance of those investments uh, to facilitate a level of uh, freedom of movement across the globe and to uh, favor their influence. And so we have to understand that and we have to understand, in our case, in Transcom's case, where it intersects and potentially counters our ability uh, to move our forces. You mentioned how you know we're, we're talking about how important allies are in this in, in terms of just kind of a self from a selfish American perspective in terms of protecting our interests and projecting our force how much we rely on our on our allies and partners and and I, I'm you know one thing I've looked at since uh, coming to uh, FDD is you know what more we can do with uh, you know democratic allies uh, for mutual benefit whether it's NATO or Japan or Australia Israel or India. Um, I noticed that uh, just this uh, on August 2nd, there was an F-35 exercise, the second uh, F-35 exercise with Israel, and there was a there was a tanker there. There was a uh, KC-10, I believe, tanker there helping to refuel those F-35s and honing U.S. combat capability and deterrence as well as Israeli and, and practicing this important refueling uh, uh, capability, which is uh, strikes me as kind of the classic win-win. It, it, it is definitely a win-win. Uh, and so from both perspectives, we find ourselves contributing to our allies and partners in the tanker situation. And we also find circumstances where our allies and partners are able to tank uh, to our uh, combat air forces. And so uh, it's, it's a win on many levels. It's, a, it's certainly a strategic win because it, it demonstrates very visibly uh, our relationship and our interoperabilities, the technical interoperabilities of our weapon systems. Um, and then it's always good. Uh, to be able to assist each other uh, in, a, you know, in, in any kind of an exercise. And that deterrence message, I would think, would be particularly important right now with COVID-19, just to demonstrate you know, that the U.S. military can continue to do what it needs to do, even despite uh, the global pandemic. That strikes me as a, a timely message. Um, General, in terms of uh, MILCON, so for those who don't reside in or near the Beltway, military construction, you know, the, the things that the Department of Defense needs to build, uh, in terms of buildings and infrastructure in order to house its people, house its equipment to conduct its mission. I'm curious, what are what are Transcom's most important military construction needs and priorities right now? Yeah, we, we rely heavily on the services uh, yeah. for the MILCON projects because they run the MILCON projects. Yeah. And what we do is we enter their process looking at the global posture, for example, and then influence those outcomes. And we've had pretty good success. Uh, we don't have a MILCON program for ourselves, for example. We rely on the services to do that, and we feed that in. Another area, though, where we do influence infrastructure is uh, with the Department of Transportation. Mm. So uh, one of the things Transcom also does is we manage for the Department of Defense 
uh, critical programs like highways for national defense, seaports for national defense, uh, railways for national defense, for example. And in the, in the area of highways, in terms of uh, federal funding, uh, we've been engaged regularly uh, with Secretary Chow, and she's been very supportive of, uh, of providing a priority framework that favors uh, DOD and national defense interests on how they allocate funding. Uh, so, so that's a very good relationship, too, to facilitate power projection from the continent of the United States. You're right to point out that uh, services take the lead in MILCON, but um, you know, no doubt Transcom relies on that to conduct your mission. You know, them getting that right. Uh, you know, one of the thing, one of the research topics we're looking at here at uh, FDD is uh, the European uh, Deterrence Initiative (EDI), and you know, what went well with that? Uh, how could it have been better? And what lessons are there that we can learn and, and apply that to potentially a similar program that Congress is going to require be stood up in the, in the Pacific, whether we call it a Indo-Pacific Deterrence Initiative or Pacific Deterrence Initiative. Are there any infrastructure or military construction requirements that you see from a transcom perspective that would be particularly important to facilitate your, your ongoing and potentially wartime mission in, in Indo-Pacific? Well, I, I really applaud the success of the EDI that you mentioned and the way that uh, UCOM and the broader community with EU and NATO uh, approach that and really facilitating uh, rapid reinforcement for the Supreme Allied Commander uh, Europe. In the Indo-Pacific, uh, very similar uh, initiatives are ongoing, uh, really to create uh, what I might describe as a, you know, multiple options. You have a different uh, geography and geometry problem out there. And so you, you do want to have a resilient network of nodes and the ability to move, uh, you know, relatively rapidly. And so, uh, uh, you know, the Indo-Pacific and the, uh, Indo-PACOM is really working along those lines and without, you know, getting into a classified forum on how they're approaching uh, future planning, uh, they, they, they've got several initiatives in that regard and we're, we're definitely integrated with them. Sounds good. Um, I'd like to turn, uh, with your permission, to air refueling. Uh, you know, why is, just for someone who doesn't do this full time or uh, enjoy talking about as much as we do, uh, why is air refueling so important uh, to not only Transcom, but to DOD and to, frankly, to American security? Why, why, is, why do we need such a robust air refueling capability? Yeah, air, air refueling is one of those areas that I think is uh, uh, probably not in, not understood as, as a criticality. Uh, so everything that we do as a joint force, uh, every problem set as described in the strategy, uh, area refueling is integral part of success. So when I describe the immediate force, and whether that's uh, you know uh, the combat air force, uh, bomber task force, uh, whatever the case may be, if we want to generate immediate combat power uh, to need. It requires tankers. Uh, they are the silent heroes. Uh, you know, f fuel is the lifeblood of the joint force. And, uh, you know, the, the, the range, uh, particularly on some of these new weapon systems, are going to be relatively limited without that tanker sitting right next to them. And so that's why it's so critical in everything that we do is ensure that we've got a, 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 a capable, and uh, sufficient area refueling fleet to meet day-to-day -day operations and then to respond to crisis and ultimately respond to conflict if, if need be. So it's really important, uh, both in terms of uh, supporting forces already in combat or conflict and, and also getting forces there. Um, yet you've testified that you know, the air refueling fleet is Transcom's most stressed capability and number one readiness concern. Why do you say that? Yeah, because it's uh, it, 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 the op tempo is actually quite high, uh, and we have not yet met our program objective of 479 tankers. We will uh, be healthy in, in the out years, um, and where the where the friction played out really on the hill, uh, I think, was a discussion about uh, the delay, right, in the in the delivery of the KC-46 to present to the joint force, and the pressure. Uh, to retire some of those legacy platforms uh, as programmed, but before the KC-46 could be presented uh, to the combatant command. And so a little bit of point of friction there. Uh, a, a lot of this capacity exists in the Guard and Reserve. And so where most of the reductions were slated to occur, 
was in the active component. And uh, we were about to reduce the active component uh, tanker capacity by 30% or more uh, against a force that's already uh, pressing deploy to dwell uh, ratios. And so that's kind of what you heard play out uh, in, in that conversation. So a delay in the delivery of the KC-46 uh, and a simultaneous retirement of older KC-10s and KC-135s potentially leaving you with uh, with insufficient air refueling capacity. Are you satisfied in terms of the current state of play with the Pentagon and the Hill uh, that you're going to be able to retain sufficient KC-10s or 135s uh, until the uh, 46 comes online? I, I am. Uh, the you know uh, the, the the leadership, the members on the Hill, uh, were very attuned to the issue. Uh, I've seen both uh, draft uh, bills. And uh, both do support uh, the retention of some number of legacy pro, uh, uh, platforms. Uh, uh, not all, we didn't advocate for all, but sufficient to, to allow us to bridge uh, until we can get the KC-46 uh, fully operational and presented to the Joint Force. That's excellent. Speaking of the, uh, more specifically on the KC-46, Valeria Incena at Defense News is wondering if I could ask you about the, uh, the remote vision system. Uh, for those who... Uh, aren't as familiar with this. Back when I was working in the Senate, I had the opportunity to go and visit the uh, New Hampshire National Guard and fly into KC-135 and got to get down there in the, in the prone position in the rear of the aircraft and kind of look at the boom and the, and the and everything. And as you know better than me, with the KC-46, that, that's, that position is eliminated and is up near in the cockpit, and it's a remote vision system that brings the refueling boom down. Uh, Boeing has had some challenges with that. Um, Valerie at Defense News was curious if, if you're satisfied with the Air Force solution uh, and, and the deal between the Air Force and Boeing and, and what your thoughts are on kind of the KC-46 timeline going forward. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll defer to the Air Force on the programmatic issues because they're the ones that ultimately have to be satisfied because they run the program uh, and so forth. But, uh, you know, the, the feedback that I get is that Boeing and the Air Force have reached an agreement, a technical agreement, and a way forward. Uh, with it, with the delivery of at least some number of airframes with the with the revised remote visual system uh, starting in 23, uh, still a lot of work to be done uh, between now and then, and so uh, we're we're really eager to see it. And um, uh, the thing I'm pleased about is it, we we got beyond this hurdle of whether we had a problem or not. It was clear uh, when I flew aboard the KC-46 that we had a, a major problem that had to be resolved. Uh, and so I think we're on a path to resolve that, uh, and, 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 and hopefully that'll be the case here in the coming years. That's great. Uh, transition to sea lift. Um, uh, why is strategic sea lift important uh, to U.S. military capability and war plans for the, for, uh, for the average American to understand? Yeah, uh, sea lift, uh, you know, is really accountable for about 90% of the cargo that we move. Uh, just a massive sheer size. Um, and, you know, I guess to your point, uh, folks probably don't have a true appreciation for the ability of the Department of Defense and what, uh, what must be moved. Uh, for example, you know, if you, if you look back on uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, you know, 500,000 uh, troops, you know, uh, 450 plus uh, shiploads, large shiploads uh, of cargo, you know, millions of short times. And so uh, sea lift uh, is really critically important in our ability to project the force, particularly uh, for the heavy forces uh, like, like the Army, which constitute the heaviest demand for, uh, for sea lift. And so, uh, you know, we've been on a, a push and making progress, by the way, uh, to really institutionalize a sea lift recapitalization effort. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the last time the fleet was recapitalized was really coming out of Desert Storm. Uh, so you think in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, you know, and, and, and we've got about half the fleet that's going to age out over the next 10 years. And so we're working closely with uh, Navy and OSD. In fact, I had a meeting earlier this morning. Uh, and I think we're making considerable progress uh, on coming to, uh, to an agreement on an acquired use strategy as the most expedient and cost-effective way to recapitalize the fleet. Uh, and then the next step really is on the Hill uh, to gain the support from Congress to get the authorization to continue to procure uh, used vessels uh, off the open market. 
I think that's um, really important to emphasize that, you know, in, in your testimony, and you just touched on it there, that uh, as I understand it, you know, the goal is 85% uh, readiness on the uh, uh, readiness rates for sea lift. And, and, and as of your testimony earlier this year, that had declined about 59%. Um, and then the other point you hit there um, is that in, in the mid 2020s, that you would lose about one to two million square feet of capacity a year in ships. And putting that in kind of more tangible terms, you had said that that's roughly two to four brigade combat teams of sea lift capacity you would be losing each year. And by the mid 1930s, uh, 2030s, wrong century, over half the sea lift will be unusable. So uh, if I have my numbers right there, General, that strikes me uh, that there's a real sense of urgency there in getting the uh, the congressional support you need to, to fulfill this important requirement. Uh, there, there is uh, definitely a sense of urgency. And, uh, you know, fortunately this year, we've had two sessions uh, with Secretary of Defense uh, of which he uh, personally chaired to look at this particular issue, uh, uh, specified that, that the deputy st st uh, established an issue a team on the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, I think we've got a good way ahead. So this is really the first time uh, at Department of Transcom Navy, we're all in the same sheet of music. We're all rolling the same direction. We all have the same strategy, same objective. And the Navy's actually put some money uh, behind the program and now we've got to get back over the hill and lay that out for them so they can see we're serious and then uh, get their support uh, to, to go to a, a acquired use strategy. One of the issues we've touched on a bit already that I'd love to dig a bit deeper into is the issue of cyber. Um, curious from a transcom mission perspective, how has the cyber threat evolved in your view? Yeah, I, I think for everybody, uh, everybody can appreciate the uh, the cyber threat, so to speak, and the vulnerabilities associated with it. So when we, when we look at that, we look at it as a warfighting domain. Mm -hmm. And uh, we recognize, uh, you know, very basics. We've got to understand our adversaries, intentions and capabilities better. We've got to understand our cyber train better. And we've got to understand our own capability to counter that. And not just here at Transcom. But our adjacent organizations, uh, JTF, Doden, Cybercom, et cetera. And uh, my sense is uh, what we've done here is really looked across a very, very broad spectrum. We're, we're a very large enterprise, global, uh, you know, for, fairly loud enterprise to boot. Uh, but what we're really trying to buy down is the consequential risk. So we're really focused uh, really on, on command and control of some very specific systems. I think we're taking the right steps uh, with Cybercom, but they've been a great partner, by the way. Uh, we're working a you know a proof of principle with them on on zero trust and attempting to scale that. Uh, but just some basic blocking and tackling, right? Some hi some hygiene, uh, uh, discipline, uh, digital modernization, uh, migration to the to the cloud. Just a just a full range of things that we've got to do. Uh, develop backup plans, alternate plans, you know. Uh, all that is underway, and so I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty pleased with the team that we have and where we're where we're headed. But we know uh, we got to keep our foot on the gas uh, because this is an area the adversary is moving uh, very rapidly in. You touched earlier on the fact that uh, Transcom depends heavily on commercial partners, and on one hand, that expands uh, the capacity of Transcom, it allows you to do more, have more throughput, if you will but also creates vulnerabilities that, as you just suggested, their adversaries can target. Uh, the House and Senate uh, National Defense Authorizations Act include provisions calling for the creation of a continuity of the economy plans to prioritize resources to critical national security functions to get them back online in the event of a widespread cyber attack. Uh, this is a key recommendation, in fact, to come out of the uh, Cyberspace Solarium Commission. But you also testified earlier this year that you're concerned that your commercial partners struggle to protect themselves against nation state cyber actors, which is understandable. I mean, if you're a middle size uh, company or just uh, even a large size company, I mean, how can you stand up to, you know, uh, nation state uh, cyber uh, actor? So adversaries could exploit these vulnerabilities, potentially, my words, not yours, to either impede vital military movements or to learn of their location or movement for intelligence or in more time, even targeting purposes. So, I mean, you touched on a little bit already, but um, how do current and potential cyber attacks on private companies 
impact Transcom's readiness and, and uh, can you give us a little bit more on what you're doing to help those civilian partners, those commercial partners uh, mitigate that risk? Yeah, there, there's a few things uh, and, and it's a very valid concern. Uh, our industry partners provide, uh, you know, a very impressive capacity, uh, but they, they can, if we're not careful, be a vulnerability. Uh, so early on in the process, we have a, by the way, we have a very close working relationship with our industry partners. Uh, so we're talking to them on a regular basis uh, right now during COVID on, on a weekly basis. Uh, and so uh, early on, it started with some very basic and fundamentals. So just meeting this standards, uh, some contractual language to make sure, you know, just some basic hygiene. And that helps a lot, by the way. You go back and look at some of the attacks that did occur in some of these industries. A lot of it was a function of just lack of good hygiene. Um, but I but I do acknowledge that an advanced persistent threat actor, a nation state actor, is a whole different game, right? And so uh, we have a different look at this too. So where where industry typically wants to do is they want to protect their financials. I appreciate that. I, I absolutely understand that. What we want to do is be able to operate, right? And so uh, we can, in some of these sectors, uh, operate uh, in what I might describe as a somewhat of a degraded, as long as we have operational systems and we can get a conveyance where we need to get the conveyance and we've demonstrated in the past we can we can work around uh systems uh, uh to do that and so you know we're working with them very closely the other thing that we have in our acquisition strategy is to ensure we never have a single uh, commercial partner that that creates a single point of failure mm -hmm. so we want multiple our strategy on acquisition we want multiple partners so we want you know we have 25 or 26 craft partners uh, 25 or 26 uh, CLIP partners. And we want to have the, the resiliency that that provides us that if we lose one for a short period of time, we have the ability to go uh, to another. And, and that's some of our mission assurance framework that we use. That's great, John. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to mention or uh, do you have any uh, concluding comments you'd like to make? Well, you, you, you clearly uh, did your homework, Brad. I appreciate that. <laughs> You hit all the really key issues, and uh, I just what I would share with you is uh, number one, I appreciate you taking the time with us today. Uh, again, I could not be more proud uh, of the airmen, the soldiers, and the sailors, and, and the Marines, uh, and frankly, in the Coast Guardsmen that are part of this great team as we work closely across the Joint Force to be able to project the force when we when we need to. So it, it, it's really uh, it's kind of it's just great to be part of this team. We've got a unique set of, a, of, of, of assigned forces. We've got a unique set of, a, uh, of authorities that we can operate globally every day, day in and day out. And we've got a unique, uh, a unique uh, stream of resourcing through a reimbursable uh, by users. And it gives us a lot of flexibility uh, to do the things that the secretary needs us to do. Well, General Lyons, this has uh, been a, a really enjoyable conversation for me. Thank you sincerely for your decades of service to our country and your continued leadership at Transcom. We all want you to succeed because your success is our success and our security. Uh, we owe you a debt of gratitude. Uh, thank you for your time. And I hope we can do this again soon, perhaps in person next time. But I wish you the best. Uh, thank you again. Thanks, Brad. Take care. Uh, this uh, concludes our discussion. Uh, thanks to those of you watching. Uh, for more information on FDD or our Center on Military and Political Power, please go to FDD.org and follow us on Twitter at FDD and at FDD underscore CMPP. Thank you again.